uh, big problems in statistics. So this p-value stuff is the stuff I dislike talking about perhaps the most because it is contentious. But I want to run back to this one little problem right here. So we'll talk a lot about p-values for the next couple weeks and compare them to what Bayesians do. So we're interested in this interval test right here. So null hypothesis, h naught is theta is an element of some set. And in this paper that I put out there, what p-values are and what they are not, by Mark Shervish, he ends up giving you the Navin Pearsonian test for doing this. So this is the optimal, the, the highest power test you can have. So for a fixed alpha level type one pair, this ends up being the rule that ends up giving you the lowest type two error when the alternative is true and you don't reject appropriately. And so here's this p-value that we covered. And so we were just doing some calculations last time. I'll come back around to this page later. New homework is up, is what that says. And we computed this value. We tried to compute this last time. And so I've computed it already for us. So I just went to norm CDF. That's what this function is right here. So this is just the norm cumulative distribution. And Mark Shervish picked these numbers. So he just picked minus 0.5 to 5 in that interval. And he's saying that he saw one data point, and the data point was 2.18. Wants to know if the center of the distribution is in this interval. That's the question at hand. And so the p-value, the corresponding p-value to this test, and this is mathematically optimal, so that sounds like a pretty good thing, is 0.0502. And Shervish obviously picked these numbers right here, 2.18, so that got something close to 0.05. Just to raise the, the alarm bells again, what do all these p-values mean? Can I take that to be 0.05? And a name Pearsonian would say, absolutely not. And so that's bigger, fail to reject. And then we computed this other p-value corresponding to this set right here. What I want you to keep in mind is that this set right here completely envelops that set. So it's bigger. And so let's just think about the question, if the parameter is in here, or I should say if the parameter is in here, then the parameter is also in here. So if theta is in there, then it should also be in there. And so, but this, if we ended up rejecting right here, we ended up making the wrong decision. Ben had pointed out last time that since the interval is getting bigger and it completely envelops that other thing, the p-value should have gotten bigger. If we think about the p-value as a measure of support for the hypothesis, if we did think about it that way, this would say that I'm more, I, I believe that it's in here more so than I believe that it's in here. Since so that's smaller than that, right here. And that doesn't make any sense because this is completely inside of that. And so if I don't think it's in here, I don't think it's in there. Make sense? So Ben kind of picked up on this just thinking about the logic and measures and thinks that if the, if the interval gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the p-value should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger as well. So the measure of support. Take this all the way to the limit. So if I just say my interval is negative infinity to infinity, then my p-value is going to be 1. And so is it in the interval negative infinity to infinity? I can't reject that. I should have no ability to reject that because it's a nonsense question. But this p-value, as I made everything bigger, it got smaller. And so Tessa was looking at this and looking at the equation and saying, well, I'm just studying the math and I'll, I'll trust that Eric Lehman came up with the right thing and I can see what's going on. The real question is, is how close you are to these endpoints. That's what this p-value is computing, how close you are to the endpoints. And so I ended up running a little bit past the endpoint. So as I got closer and closer and closer, one of this p-value was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then I ended up running past it. And there's an inflection in this curve. 
So this is not a monotonic function. And so we can end up looking at this hypothesis as well. So Shervish computes that for us also. Let's just see what it is. Minus 5, 6, 5, 2. And that p-value just got a little bit bigger. So if you just look at this, I have my p-value 0.05. Let's write down what this value is. 0.0515. I ended up expanding the interval a little bit. The p-value got bigger. Ben's happy. That makes sense to him. And he keeps expanding it, and the p-value starts shrinking. And that's a real problem, this non-monotonicity. And so this is what Bayesians are always talking about when they say incoherence. So p-values are not coherent measures. So they're not measures of the null hypothesis. So let me just write that down. This is the conclusion of Service's paper. P-values, in general, are not measures of support. funky measuring stick. So it doesn't operate correctly. So you're saying that you're observing non-monotonicity, but what does the word coherent imply? Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you more about it, but what I always think about is the additivity property of measures. And so this isn't additive, is a problem. And so I'll go more into that. So that there's something wrong is how we're going to think about it. So additivity and incoherence is what I'm kind of pairing up. So I'll just point out as a prelude in posteriors, if I build measures on spaces, if I end up making the intervals bigger, the, the measure gets bigger. And so, and if I wanted to know what's the probability of not the null hypothesis, I'd just take one minus whatever my probability of my null is, and that'll give me my probability of the alternative. These p values are clearly not doing that. So I want to point out one other thing in this, other than we, in general, be a little bit careful about this. In the one-sided case, I do believe the p-value is measuring something probably reasonable because it is additive. And so I think we mentioned that a long time ago, but we'll look at it in more detail. But in general, they're not measures of support uh, for H0. I want to point out that, and I said this last time, that the limit of this, if I end up taking theta 1 and theta 2 and I push them together, I end up getting uh, the point null test that they would teach you in STAT 101. And if I ended up taking theta 1 or theta 2 and blowing it out to <coughs> negative infinity or infinity respectively, then I'd get the one-sided test. So this limit of this interval test does give us the test that we usually play around with. So let me just ask you a question. If we're doing the one-sided test, And we compute a p-value. And I'll say it's equal to p tilde. Okay, so I compute some number, it's p tilde. And you ended up just doing the one-sided test. You use this rule to do it. Typical STAT 101 rule. And you come up with this number, p squiggle, and the magic number that we're usually thinking about is 0.05. We'll talk about that in a moment. But change your mind. And wanted to compute the p value to the two sided test.
two sided test. So here's my question. What's the p value? Two p tilde. Say it again. Two p tilde. Two p. So it's twice as big. So sometimes you see people do this really bizarre maneuver in stats. They end up computing the one-sided or they end up computing the, the two-sided thing, and they come up with 2p, and it's like 0.07. And they go, uh-oh, I can't do anything with that. So I'm going to move over to the one-sided, and I'm going to compute 0.035. And every statistician in the room should tell you that that is a big faux pas to do anything like that. But a lot of people do do this. They'll go search for like a new test even that like brings down the p-value a little bit. And so I think Chris Frank, you know, teaches all this under the guise of key hacking. So I think that's the, the typical uh, expression for this, is when you just start maneuvering everything until you get a, a smaller p value. You might start playing around with outliers and stuff like that as well. But Ben would be upset by this right there. And so if Ben still believed that p-values were a measure on the hypothesis, the reason this is really problematic is how big is the space being tested corresponding to the two-tailed test? It's just a point. And so it's infinitely smaller than the set being tested in the one-sided case. So that has totally different cardinality. And so they're not even comparable. One set is much, much bigger, but the p-value is half as big. So that doesn't make any sense. So you can just kind of go back to stat 101 and convince yourself you cannot compare p-values from two-sided tests to one-sided tests. They're not measures of support on the null hypothesis, period. And so it's irrational to think so after just kind of analyzing this. So what is the p-value? So let's at least answer that. So we know what it's not. Not a measure on the hypothesis space. What is the key value? We can all answer this in our sleep. Under the null hypothesis, the probability of seeing your data are more extreme data. But what is it? What is it doing? What's it for? What's the point? And so there was a big argument that surfaced over this. Neyman and Pearson were well aware that the p-value was not a measure of support on the null hypothesis, and Fisher had been using it that way. And kind of the way he phrased things made you feel that way about it. So it was kind of a misinterpretation. So Pearson came in, baby Pearson, Egon, with Neyman, and said, let's do something with this. And they ended up saying, if you come up with an alpha level as your type one error, that if this value p ducks it, then you'll reject the null hypothesis incorrectly, uh, whatever that number alpha is. And so this is where the debate comes from. So Fisher wants it to feel like a measure, wants to use it that way, and everybody knows that it's not quite that. So Neyman and Pearson come up with the alpha level. introduce the alpha level, where alpha is the type 1 error rate. We check. And I should say, whoever this fictitious we is, because I don't actually do this. So, but, um, name in Pearsonians. Check if P tilde is less than alpha. If it is, they reject. And somehow this is supposed to be the type one error. So to put this together, you have to establish that 
a p-value under the null hypothesis has a known distribution. And I think most of you know what it is. It's a uniform distribution. Well, let me just say that as a fact. I've got a couple different versions of proofs of this, and maybe we can go over them next week. So note, under H0, p-values are uniformly distributed. And so if the null hypothesis is true, then this number will be less than alpha, how often? Alpha percent of the time. So, because this is a uniform random number. If the alternative is true, it's not uniformly distributed, it's something else. And it decays as a function of n very fast. But if the null hypothesis is true, this number that we're computing is just a draw from a uniform. How often would a draw be less than alpha in a uniform? Alpha. And so that's why that is true. What's the actual power of everything? If you compute your p-values off of a name in Pearsonian test, and it has the smallest type 2 in the highest power. So, so Neyman and Pearson kind of got everybody going with this. So some people call this Wald testing. So Wald gets into the game and writes papers on this, how to use all this. And they say, just got to pick alpha. So you established what your alpha is, and you pick, and you compute p, and you see if it dumps alpha. And so really, under the null, you're just drawing a uniform. Here's the rub. You've got to pick alpha before you see p. And so a lot of people don't do that right. So they end up saying, well, I got a, a p-value of 0.07, so I'll take my alpha to be 0.1. And as soon as you do that, you've just moved around the whole theory. Your error rates are not 0.1. Some people will teach you to do this mentally, and they'll say, well, if your alpha would have been 0.1, and you reject it, then you would have only done that wrong 10% of the time. But that's exactly the same thing. You're supposed to specify alpha before you even do this. And Fisher hated that. So Fisher wanted a con continuous measure of support on the hypothesis. And he kind of had a sense that in the one-sided case, everything works out OK. Why can't I use it in this two-tailed case, the sharp test? That's the test that most people are doing. But anyway, I'm not sure what a p-value is. I think on its own, it's nothing. So it means very little to me. If you had done this and you had correct model and you specified alpha, then I at least understand the mathematical premise that you're guarding against certain error rates. What I think the trouble is, is that usually you don't have the right model. You have a slightly contaminated model. So we made it up. And the p-value will be not uniformly distributed if that's true. If you use the wrong model, you'll reject the model. If that is big. Let me give you a prescription real quick. I'll give you some good news because I'm giving you a ton of bad news. Here's the good news. I know what the game is. I just want to do science. I want to get published. I want to get fame and fortune, a Nobel Prize perhaps. I'm, I'm not trying to be too selfish about all of this. And so I really just, you know, I want all the praise of the scientific community. So I need small p-values. So the good news is this. You can get very, very small p-values. Smaller the p-value. I don't know what Scotland's talking about. He's talking gibberish about math and stuff. I just need small p-values. And so I need to go write my paper. So I'll give you an algorithm for doing it. So you can get very, very small p-values. Here's the algorithm. Does anybody know? What would you do? Make a very, very bad guess. OK, so you can make a very, very bad guess, but I'm not sure the scientific community would be fooled by that. Increase so, the sample size. Sample size. Just keep picking it up. 
So if you compute a p-value, it's not ducking whatever your favorite threshold is. Maybe it's 0.05, because we have five fingers. And you computed something that's 0.08, and you think, ah, oh, shucks. I need a smaller p-value. I need to duck 0.05. We'll follow the prescription, and we'll go get more data. So what is the, under the alternative, what is the p-value doing? It's getting small. So we know that increasing n will make it smaller and smaller. What happens under the null hypothesis? It's still uniformly distributed. And so I'm just taking uniform draws until I finally duck alpha. It will work every time. With probability one, this will work. So increase n. So for the two-tailed test, it will always fail if you have enough samples. You will always reject. So this is really problematic. So Ben just pointed out, again, you're going to reject. It's guaranteed to happen. And so this isn't science. And unfortunately, a lot of people do this. And so you see this in a lot of papers. That they go, well, we got a not too small of a p-value, but our power wasn't too big, so we're going to go out and increase the sample size. And they write another grant for it. And so I've seen that written up. <laughs> so why are the p values also uh, uniform distributed? Math. So it's a random variable. We can prove that. Just think about how you actually compute it and prove that. It ends up looking exactly like the proof to the inverse CDF algorithm. And so let's go over a couple different versions of that proof next week. So for the Newman-Hilson uh, uh, level, actually, we can also arbitrary pick up a lava level. Yeah, that's problematic. So you're supposed to start with one. If you're, if you're following what Naaman, Pearson, and Walt said, you've got to start with one. And so if you miss that, you're not doing it. You're playing a mathematical parlor trick. So in trying to claim something that might not be true, and then somebody comes in, checks your amazing result, takes your Nobel prize away from you, because it turns out you rejected it correctly. You rejected the wrong thing. So this isn't good news. This is actually really sad news. So I don't think this is great. People do it all the time. They're really happy to do this. I used to try to think about like when I go to parties, and I would ask people what they were working on and how they do their hypothesis testing, and I'd point this out to them. And I was very unpopular. So people didn't want to talk about it. And really, the sentiment was, I just don't care. So I just need small p. Everybody else is doing this. What are you talking about? And so this is the standard. Most statisticians, at least that get into this and understand it, they know this is a problem. And so we say, well, we teach p-values because it's the statistical language that most people are familiar with. But we try to tell them all these things. And I'm not sure it's true. You know, when I read articles, I read that statisticians are telling people, but I never heard this. You know, for years, and I was doing statistics, and I was just kind of following this algorithmic pattern. Um, Try to think what else I should say about this. Let's look at one more thing. Here's an interesting example. So, example. Okay, say this x odd comes from a normal distribution with mean theta and variance sigma squared. Okay, everything's IID. And I want to test this. Stat 101 test. This is the most used test probably in all of statistics. And my contention is, is that it's a problem. And it doesn't mean what people think it means. But let me show you something. So how do we usually test this? We usually compute a statistic. So we'll typically compute our z-score. And I'll just point out that this is a function of n. So this is the z score. 
how do we do this? Take x bar, subtract off our null hypothesis, absolute value, we're doing the two-sided thing, and then I divide by the standard here. Sigma over root n. So I'm going to say that this is no. Nothing changes, really. If I didn't know that, I would have to estimate it, and that thing would converge nicely to sigma. So if I just use the sum of squared errors divided by n, take a square root over the top, converge to sigma. So I could estimate that if I didn't know that. So there's nothing really all that important about knowing this. I'll point out that this is a function of n as well. And I want to think about what this statistic means as n increases. So and I want to think about what certain values of this statistic mean. So let's just say this thing is equal to 1.96. Okay, so this corresponds to alpha equal to 0 0.05. So this would be the threshold that you have to cross for me to reject this null hypothesis. So if I see something bigger than 1.96, I reject. If I see something smaller than 1.96, I fail to reject. That's the typical STAT 101 language. So this is a magic number. So let's just think about what this means under different sample sizes. So I'm going to contend under differing sample sizes One point nine six means very different things. So let's just think about this. As n goes to infinity, I like to think about limits, what happens, it tells me about the process, what's the limiting part of the process. So as n goes to infinity, I want to understand what this statistic just did. The denominator is very easy to analyze. So what does that go to as n goes to infinity? Zero. Zero. Cool. Right on. It goes to zero. So what must this be doing? This has to be going to something as well. If that's going to zero, and this is 1.96 for an astonishingly large number, the number is so big that we can't actually write it down. So this is a concept. What is this thing going to? It's also going to zero. It has to. How fast is it going to zero? 1.96 times faster. Square root of n. What? Is that right? So it's going to zero 1.96 times faster than the denominator. This is like how derivatives are computed, how we interpret them. These limits of the denominator and the numerator. And so x bar must be going to theta naught. x bar n is going to theta naught. So that's what this is doing. So and that is what we're testing. That's what this test is based off of. So it's going to theta naught. But I also know what x bar goes to as well. x bar n goes to the truth. So which is theta. Why is that true? So x bar goes to the truth. Yeah. Lots of reasons. Central limit theorem, weak law, strong law. You decide which law you want to use. But they all tell us that it's going to the truth. Central limit theorem tells us how it's distributed as it's strictly approaching it. And so that means that theta must be theta naught if they're both going to the same things. So the null hypothesis is true in this case. So if n is very, very, very big, and I see 1.96, I'm inclined to think that the null hypothesis is true. So let's make the number 1.97 so we're not arguing. You know? And so you reject the null hypothesis if it's 1.97. Yet I'm saying I believe the null hypothesis is true because of math. <coughs> and so this is what the classicists would come back with. They would say, well, it's still two standard deviations away from the truth. 
And that's what it's doing. It's two standard errors away from the truth. But how big is that distance as n goes to infinity is <coughs> unmeasurable. So if n is very, very big, it's epsilon. So it's something arbitrarily small. So this is where statisticians come in and they'll say, well, I never said that statistical significance meant anything practically. And I've heard that in a lot of Stat 101 classes where they say statistical significance doesn't mean practically significant. That's a problem for me. Then what are we doing? And so what's the whole point? Now, I could understand if a physicist came in and said, no, I really care if I'm two standard deviations away in my measuring tool. I need to be within that. I want to measure that. This p-value would be your friend. It would tell you how many standard errors you're off by. But in terms of doing science is theta, theta, naught, I don't think this is the right thing to do. And so again, your magic prescription is just crank up n. And so you'll get small p-values. So this is the replication crisis. Let's show you, let's stop harping on these guys. P-values, name and Pearsonian and stuff. Let's talk about what a Bayesian could do. So Bayesians do things completely differently. So let's just look at Bayesian. Sharp testing. So again, I just want to test if theta is equal to theta naught versus it's something different. So let's imagine we've got the same setup. X came from a normal distribution, some parameter. You can let this be sigma squared. And I want to test this thing. And so Bayesian might get a whole bunch of data. I goes from 1 to n. They need a prior on their space. Bayesian chooses a prior. So I've got some data. I want to do this test. I need to form a posterior. So Bayesian does one thing. They form posteriors. So which prior would you choose? Um, theta equal, um, proportional to 1. Maybe proportional to 1. So maybe that's OK. So maybe Ben is usually pretty good at this. Let's trust Ben. We'll go with that. So I end up picking this prior. And so I compute my posterior. So theta given all of my data is normally distributed, centered at x bar, and it has variance sigma squared over n. The first week of class we came up with that. And that's the distribution that most people would use. We just interpret it differently. And so to do the hypothesis, probability of theta being an element of H naught, given all of my data, it's just going to be the integral of pi theta given my data. This is what a Bayesian means. They just integrate over their null space. And so, can I integrate from theta naught to theta naught? What's this? Zero. That's zero. So, this is even a better scientific tool than the p value because you don't even have to go run off and get a whole bunch of data to do this. You'll get zero every single time. So, this is a real magic wand right here. You can go write all your papers and reject everything. So, and that's what people want to do. So this one's even better. So obviously I'm joking. So this can't be the right procedure. So we know how to do it in an interval, and we know how to do it in the one side of the case. We just integrate over those intervals, and everything would work great. But for this point null problem, things are a little bit peculiar, and we have to try harder. I want to point out that in our solution, we assume this. So this is a horrible answer. But we assume something. The probability of H naught a priori was zero. I integrate over pi theta, it's a continuum in there, d theta from theta naught to theta naught. This was zero. 
So a priori, Ben told us the null hypothesis had no possibility of being true. He didn't mean to do that, but that's what he told us. So when he ended up saying, let's use a flat prior, or if he used a conjugate prior, we would have had the same problem. Any continuous prior would have been problematic. And so a priori, if you start with an assumption that there's no possibility, no data can override that. Multiplying by zero, you can never escape zero. And so we can't use this prior. So Bayesian, what they need to do is they need to put mass on the null space. So I'm just going to conclude by saying this is the actual prior people use. So point null testing. Requires prior with non-zero mass on the null. And this is one such prior. So the prior might look like this. Pi theta is going to be equal to pi naught delta function. Theta is equal to theta naught plus 1 minus pi naught times some prior on the alternative space. So I'll end up just writing down pi h alternative theta. So let me just write out what these terms mean. This is the probability of h naught. This is 1 minus the probability of h naught. Since our null hypothesis is just at one point, this is my continuous distribution over that one point. Because the null is only on that. This is my alternative distribution on the alternative space. Everything but that point. Now you might ask, why didn't I put 1 minus the delta function over here? It's just because if I integrated this over the point, it would zero out. And so it's just a little bit redundant to write it down. Saying that, you can if you want. This is called a point mass prior. So can h alpha, pi of h alpha be continuous? It should be continuous. So because the alternative lives in a continuum minus that one point. So I need to tell you all kinds of stuff about this, how it works. But a lot of people will zoom in to this thing right here and say, how do you think that? And it turns out the culprit is really in here. And I want to tell you all about it. But that's where we're going to be going next week. So on Friday, Bayesian key testing. And next week, we'll be analyzing the Bayesian solution to this. And I'll give you good news and bad news about it. And so I do like the answer in a mathematical sense. Using it practically can be challenging. I'll tell you what those challenges are. That's it for right now, guys. Thanks.